I told you we were talking about dating. Did I mention dating? We're going to talk about dating today. So today's kind of a special thing. Um, I'm not a youth pastor, so I don't talk about dating very often, amen? Um, but it's been a long, long time, and I'm going to try and remember, Ricky. Um, it might be bad, but I'm going to try and remember. So we're, we're talking about dating today, and dating's kind, of a, dating's kind of an interesting topic. It's kind of a special topic to talk about in church, and we're going to delve into why. But first, I want to read Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 9 to you. Because it will inspire you. you. You you have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. Do you hear the poetry, gentlemen? You've captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You, you hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Some of you guys need to take that and text that to her. Amen? Man. We're talking about dating. You've captured my heart. Does it, does it stir anything up for you? Do you remember those days? Were they too long ago? Right? Like the chocolates and the flowers and the dinner and the movies out. And the butterflies in your stomach. Anybody remember that? Anybody at all? You better fake it. You better start faking it right now that you remember all of that good stuff. And he's so hot and she's so hot. And the, the tingly feelings and dating is such a great time of life. Except when it wasn't great. <laughs> except when it isn't great. Except when it's like the most painful thing ever. Can I get an amen? Because we've also all been there too. Here's what's weird about dating and talking about dating in churches. In church, we're almost always talking about commitment. We're almost always talking about a love that never lets go. That was actually week one. A love that never lets go. And covenant. And being in that covenant with someone and always hoping for them. And never giving up on them, right? Like, like we talk about that a lot in the church. What we don't talk about is choosing. We don't talk about choice very much. We don't talk about the fact that before you're married and before you're in that covenant, there's actually a very wise and appropriate season where you're choosing a partner and a mate. And you need wisdom in that choosing process because, because you can choose, but, but you got to choose wisely. It's like that old knight in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade when he puts all the goblets out there and says, choose wisely. In that creepy old man voice. And then the guy's face melts off. Choose wisely. You need to choose wisely today. Look at Song of Solomon. This is 6 verse 8. It says, even among 60 queens and 80 concubines and countless young women, I would still choose my dove, my perfect one, the favorite of her mother, dearly loved by the one who bore her. You love that? This is years later and Solomon is looking at his wife. And he's saying, even if someone came and gave me countless choices again, I would still choose you. Some of you need to say that to her tonight. I would still choose you. Amen. I would still choose you. I think that's so powerful. But dating, dating is that moment of choosing. And, and not just the person that we're attracted to. It's the person that is a wise partner for us as we go into, uh, as we go into a life together. Choose wisely. Today is about not ignoring the signs. I was talking to somebody, it was actually even just last week, and their, their, their marriage was struggling, and they, they just said this thing to me, and often people will say this to me when a marriage is struggling. They will say, Pastor, I got to tell you, I ignored the signs. I remember back to when we were dating, and I saw the early signs of what I'm dealing with in this partnership right now and what's making this partnership difficult. And I ignored the signs. I shouldn't ignore, have ignored the signs. Everybody tried to tell me and I didn't listen. Why? Because we were intoxicated by love. And when you're drunk, you don't make the wisest decisions. Come on, second service. I know it's cold. You all right? <laughs> Proverbs 27, verse 12 I love this. A prudent person sees trouble coming and ducks. A simpleton walks in blindly and is clobbered. Say clobbered. Say clobbered. <laughs> now, I, I think I read about three or four different translations of that verse. They all basically say the same thing, but this was the funniest. That's why you got it this morning because it said clobbered. And I just love the way that it made it so, so clear. This seems so obvious, right? Like, all of us should see the signs, and we should all respond to the signs. 
right? Like everybody does that, right? Ah. So let me break it down even more grade school for us. When you're sensible, the verse says, you're going to see the trouble and you're going to avoid it. Or you're so focused on what you have to have. So I have to, that you walk in blind and you get hurt. Gosh, how much of, how much of our life does that verse right there describe? Whew. Don't admit that out loud. Don't do it. So what we're going to do, okay, so the, the, the rest of this morning's message is going to be, what should we see coming? What are the signs that maybe things aren't going the way that they're supposed to go? What are the signs that maybe I'm about to get clobbered if I don't avoid this? We're going to look at those signs. And the rest of this message is going to be a little bit like a counseling session because a lot of this has come out of Linda and I counseling young couples before they get married. But first, before I give you those six signs that maybe you're dating the wrong person, how's that for a title? Six signs you might be dating the wrong person. Um, I, I was going to tell you that, that uh, I was first inspired by signs that you might be dating the wrong person. There's a, there's a YouTube channel called Good Mythical Morning, and if you're a fan of Good Mythical Morning, you might know Link. And Link sits down at one time, at one point, and he gives golden advice for single guys. And he sits down on this chair with a fire roaring in the background and a big pipe in his mouth. And he's a total dork. And he says, "I'm going to give you golden advice for single guys." And then he will. He just goes through this list of somewhat comical things, and then says, "Red flag." Say, "Red flag." Red flag. And he says, red flag. So one thing is like a tattoo. Like if, if they've got a tattoo, that might not be a red flag. But if it's a tattoo of a Disney character, maybe you should slow down. Um, and I started thinking about other golden advice for single guys. Like maybe if they approach two bowls of Doritos and one was Cool Ranch and one was Nacho Cheese. There's only one clear answer, folks. <laughs> right? Um, Ricky was telling me one of his, which is really important, like, watch the way that they pour cereal. Do they put the milk in first into the bowl? <laughs> Or do they start with the cereal? Because we all know what the right answer is there. And, and these are good tests. And, and maybe you're a comic book person like myself, and you're thinking it's either Marvel or DC. Come on. Come on. Everybody knows the answer. And I almost put down the, uh, the teams for the Super Bowl, but I don't even know if the playoffs are done yet. <laughs> Like, I'm like, that would just be a lie for me to admit that I even know what's happening in football right now. So I'm going to leave that off the list. So, all right. So here's where we're going to turn the corner into actually serious red flags, signs that maybe the person you're meeting, or you're, that you're dating right now is not the right person. Number one, they aren't complete as a single person. They aren't whole. And this is where it's all going to get serious. It is one of the best romantic movie moments in romantic movie history when Tom Cruise walks into the living room and Renee Zellweger is across the living room and he says to her, you know, you complete me. He says, you complete me. And we all just, oh, so good. But it's wrong. It's wrong. And, and, and here's the thing, it sounds so great. It sounds like, wow, I'm just the puzzle piece of their life. But it's like, no, no, no. They need to be whole before you show up. They need to be healthy. They need to be stable before you showed up. And when they are healthy and whole and stable and you come in, then it's out of the overflow of their health that they love you. And that's the way healthy relationships are supposed to work. There are different ways that we are complete and whole. I'll, I'll, I'll go into this just a little bit. Like my daughter right now is away at college. And as a family, in some ways, we don't feel complete while she's not there. Does that make sense to you? We don't feel totally complete. But it's just because we miss her and it's just because we want her around. It doesn't mean that like we can't be okay. 
And see, when she comes, because we're healthy, when she comes for the holidays, we get to, out of the overflow of our love, right, we get to, and that's good. But when you notice that your partner could not live for more than a few months without a romantic partner in their life, and they're moving from person to person to person, and it, they have to have somebody else. Slow down. Be careful. You need to be enough. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, for you, so you also are complete through your union with Christ. I just love the way that that verse puts it. It says that Jesus, before he even came here, he was complete. He was full of God. He was complete. And out of that fullness, see, he overflowed to us and he makes us complete as well. So you can be 100% fine with Jesus. And Pastor Ricky's going to preach more on this in about three weeks. We're going to talk about singleness. And that singleness is not like God's consolation prize for poor Christians. I got you on that one, didn't I? But that we're so complete in Jesus that we don't have to have a person. And that that's okay. Okay, we'll keep moving. Uh, number two sign is that they're not for real pursuing Jesus. And, and this is going to feel pretty dated to some of you. It's going to feel pretty old-fashioned. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And that word yoked there is a really weird farming term. You're like, why are we talking about farming terms? It's just an illustration, right? It's just a picture. And what he's doing is like, have you ever seen a stagecoach? Picture of a stagecoach and there's multiple horses all tied up together and they're pulling the stagecoach forward. All he's saying here is there's got to be a quality in the team that's pulling that stagecoach forward. Because if one is weak and another one's strong, or one wants to go this direction and the other one wants to go a different direction, you're not going to have a functional stagecoach. So he says, you've got to be partnered correctly. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what does fellowship, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? I heard a teacher say once, don't marry a Christian. They said, marry someone who loves Jesus. Because there's a difference. And some of us have been taught that it's all about appearances. Some of us have ta been taught that it's all about who's in the religion and who's out of the religion. And it's not about any of that. It's about having a functional partnership with someone who has a similar value system to you. I mean, don't we go on social media and look for people with similar interests to us? Isn't that how some of our best relationships form? It's the same thing with the marriage. Someday, the very top, number one value, your entire life is gonna be Jesus. And if theirs isn't Jesus, it's gonna be really hard. And I don't want it to be really hard. Every major intersection of your life, you'll have a decision if you become married. Will we do what Jesus says or will we do something else? So go with me practically for a second. How are we going to raise the kids? What kind of school are we going to put them in? Right? How are we going to discipline the kids? What's our relationship to the in-laws going to be like? And one of you might in that moment say, well, this is what the Bible says, or this is what Jesus has for us. And if you're not both on the same page of where your standard comes from, it's going to be such a hard conversation. What do we do with money? What do we do with generosity? Like if there's somebody in need or there's a homeless person and we feel led that God's saying, give the money to the homeless person, yet, yet we want to save up for the new boat. What's going to win? Are we on the same page? Because it matters. Are we going to take our kids to church? It matters. What TV are we going to watch? Will Rotten Tomatoes drive us? Or will character drive the choices that we make? Is it okay to keep flirting with other people of the opposite sex after we're married? Or is that off limits? 
You could be in a, in a moment one day where you're like, Jesus wouldn't want that, and it needs to matter. And when we fight, will we fight well? And will we pursue forgiveness with each other? Like the Bible says, will divorce be an option? Will divorce be a club that we beat each other with in the future? See, it's, it's not about Christian or non-Christians. Do they love Jesus? Are we going to form a good partnership, a healthy partnership together? Pastor Craig Rochelle has a quote. He says, don't give them your heart if God doesn't have theirs. And right in this moment, and I know we're only two red flags in, but right in this moment, some of you already are in this really tense place on the inside. And you're like, Pastor, you are limiting my options. And if I could kindly say it back to you, I would say every time in your life that you raise your standards, it will limit your options. <laughs> and I think you're worth it. And I think God thinks you're worth it. Red flag number three, when those you love don't love who you're dating. It's the third sign. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. It's just, there, there's just this, there's just this life decision that you make that you look around at the people that are closest to you and you say, they are gifts from God to me, to help me, to give me advice, to give me perspective. And especially when I'm choosing a lifelong partner to be an early warning system for me. And if you want to be super hardcore about it, don't just wait for them to hint to you that maybe your situation isn't so great. Maybe ask them. Yeah. Ooh, that's bold. And I don't mean ask the friend who always tells you what you want to hear. They're great. I'm talking about your wise friends that might be able to come and say to you, we've noticed he seems too controlling. Or the coach that might come to you and say, I sense an unhealthy neediness here. Or your mom or dad who loves you so much, who just says very specifically, I love you. I'm not trying to make your decisions for you. But I'm just telling you that when I see them flirt with other people, I think that's unhealthy. And do you listen? And do you let them be that early warning system? How are we doing so far? You okay? All right, three down, three more to go. Here comes number four. When you don't experience healthy conflict with them. Like you're already fighting. It's, it's funny, some, sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, the reason I know this is a great relationship is because we never fight. <sighs> nope. Nope, and it's, 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 that's, it's just a, if you found your soulmate, it doesn't mean there won't be friction. There will be friction. And if you're not fighting at all, it's probably an indicator that you're not living in vulnerability with each other. You're not being real, honest. So there needs to be some fighting. But also on the other end, there doesn't need to be fights all the time. And every single day that are out of control and that are worrying you. And there's some things I'm going to say to you guys today, and some of you guys are in these romantic relationships, and you're sitting there, and you're going to start to hear this, and it's going to start to get uncomfortable for you, and I know that, and, and I'm not mocking your relationship. I'm not mocking you. I'm really not. I'm not going to do, I'm not, you're going to find, I'm not going to use much humor in the rest of this message because I don't want it to feel like mocking. This is, this is, this is just counseling kind of truth, and I hope you can hear it. Because some, some of you, you've already started to worry and wonder about whether or not this is okay. And I might call some things out for you today. And I hope it's helpful to you today. When they fight, do they fight fair with you? Or do they use anger to dominate you? Do they use volume? Do, do they use an authoritative push behind their voice to push you down? Is winning what's more important to them? Or do they go the other way? Do they use silence and do they just silence you to death? Right? Like silent treatment is a thing and it can become manipulative. 
And let's talk about manipulation for a second. Do they manipulate? Right? Do they, do they, do they use words of flattery over and over and over again, way too much towards you? And do they use it as a way to make you relationally indebted to them so now you owe them? Or do they give gifts to you? And you can just sense that when they give the gift, the giving of the gift is not kindness and love, an expression that's given and then let go of. There are strings attached with the gift that they give to you. And they give the gift with an expectation of now you owe me. Sometimes people in an abusive relationship, there'll be a moment of abuse. And then instead of confession and repentance and willingness to work and heal from it, there's the giving of a gift afterward that is meant to say, it's all okay what I did, right? It gets really silent, right? Yeah. Let me read a verse to you. James, everyone should be quick, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We need to be slow to speak. It's okay to get angry, but we need to be slow about it. Let me tell you another story. This is about my puppy, Millie, because we need a breather here for a second, okay? <sighs> my puppy, Millie. So we got her back, I think it was the end of October, and she's wonderful. And, and if you were here for Christmas, I told you that she's the best dog in the world, and she's better than your dog. Our dog is better than your dog. That's super important that we establish that. Millie is so great, right? It's like she's this tiny little puppy kind of a dog, and she's wonderful. But here's one of the things that I've learned about interacting with this new dog, because I'm brand new to dogs, okay? I've never had a dog until Millie. Um, so here's one of the things I'm learning with this new dog, is that she works on the alpha dog system. Right? So she's been, she's been bred through this line of like pack, you know, the pack mentality of like, we're a pack and we need to fight each other to figure out who the alpha dog is in this pack or we won't survive, right? Like out in the wild, but we're not out in the wild. We're in Oklahoma in the suburbs, <laughs> but she's still, you know, she's still fighting it. And so it, it's really important that Millie not be the alpha. And you learn this in dealing with your dog. And, and the truth is, we all know it in our house that the true, the, the true alpha in our family is Linda anyway. <laughs> so there's that. Amen. Amen. So <sighs> look at Ephesians 5.21. I want you to see this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's a big verse for relationships. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Like I'm revering and respecting Jesus, who is the Alpha, yes? And he's the only Alpha. And none of the rest of us are. Out of reverence for Christ... We submit to each other. And maybe on this day, I'm going to submit to your wisdom about finances. And maybe the next day, you're going to submit to my wisdom about this. And then it bounces back and forth, depending on how God has gifted us and the wisdom that he's given us over the years and different things like that. But we're going to come together as, hear this, equals. Yes. We're going to come together as equals, and we're going to negotiate. And we're going to negotiate to unity. And unity is what's important, not dominance in your relationship. Why? Because you are a Christian and not a dog. And if you're in a romantic relationship right now, and you can just sense they have to win, they have to dominate. That's what they're after, not the resolution. It could be a red flag. All right, number five. They won't work on their habits and hangups. It doesn't say they don't have habits and hangups because we've all got them, amen? We've all got them. But do we hide them or do we work on them? And this is critical, and it's critical even in the dating relationship. You need to see that 
Proverbs 28, 13, look at what God's word is so practical. Look at what it says. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, then they'll receive mercy. It's not saying we ought to do an x-ray on you and find that you're the perfect person. That's not what it says. It says, don't conceal it. Be honest. And then do what you can to start the process of turning away from that. And it may be years in the process of you turning from that, but you're willing to do the work. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess, do you see what God does? I want you to confess. I want you to show up. If we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So they've got out of control rage. They've got harsh words. They cross lines, not just in domineering you, but they say things that people shouldn't say to people that they care about in anger. What do you do with that? And will they work on it? What about alcohol? You get into that relationship and you start seeing the signs. Something else is in the room with us. There's alcohol over there. There's a porn addiction over there, right? There's, there's a, a completely overblown dependency on mom and dad. There's all kinds of things. Addictions take a lot of forms, or it's, or it's a mental health struggle. It's there's depression here. There's cutting here. There's anxiety here. It's, it's not the shock of like, oh my gosh, there's a problem. It's what are we going to do with it? And do we get to talk about it? Are we open about it? Because if they're not open about it and it gets shoved into the dark corner and that's what we do not speak of, huge red flag. They need to admit that they've got it. They need to talk about it. They need to be willing to read the books. They need to be willing to talk to a pastor, talk to a counselor, go to the AA meeting. They need to do all the things to be healthy And it's not just to be healthy for your personal comfort in the relationship. Don't go down that road because that'll talk you out of it. You're going to bring kids into this relationship someday by God's grace. And your kids should grow up seeing a mom and dad who knew how to do the work and knowing that when sin shows up, it doesn't mean that we're bound for the rest of our life. Somebody say amen. 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 Next one. Oh, I got to say this just real fast. So one of the reasons that Linda and I recommend before you come and do, you do premarital counseling or premarital class with us, that you've been dating for at least a full calendar year. Just throw that out there. It's healthy. It's healthy to see them in all the seasons of the year. Because he might be different in the wintertime, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes this military town is all about the speed, you know what I mean? Slow it down. I'm just telling you, slow it down. And I know there's military benefits for rushing into relationships. And... <laughs> Did I cross the line? <laughs> we will not uh, officiate a, a, a wedding here unless there's a certain number of sessions that we're able to do together because we want to slow things down. I think that's good for you that we slow things down. Okay, number six then. When they're leading you away from Jesus instead of closer. Big flag. flag. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. And I know that seems so old-fashioned. A lot of this does seem so old-fashioned. But here's the thing. Are they pulling you away from Jesus or toward him? Because the goal of your life is to get as close to Jesus as possible. Amen? Amen. And sometimes some relationships, they're just not in that place where they're going to help you do that. And it's hard enough. It's hard enough to seek God. 
and to not let life pull you away from seeking God over and over and over again. And sometimes you need a coach that's going to encourage you toward him, not away from him, yes? Yes. And if you've been dating, stop yourself every two months, three months, and say, are we going to church as much as before I met them? Are we still in like a life group or community the same way? Really good, healthy friends in my life. Have I, tra- have I had to shut down those friendships so that I could be with this person? Those are flags. Is it okay for me to be in God's word? Is it okay for me to talk about Jesus? Or every time I bring up Jesus, do they get uncomfortable? And so I find myself getting quieter and quieter about Jesus. Because all that happens, guys. It's a red flag. Okay, last story. So back when I was in high school, there was this girl, Stacy, and I know what you're thinking. Has Linda approved this story? And she has. <laughs> it's still really questionable, but she, she approved it. So long before I met Linda, So I'm in like trigonometry class, which is such a romantic place to be, by the way. And I'm in high school. And I don't know anything, right? And um, so I'm in trigonometry class, and and I'm in the second to last row, and she's in the last row, and she's in the seat directly behind me, Stacy. And I start getting interested in Stacy, and we're talking, and we form a little friendship in trigonometry class, and we're making trouble, and the teacher's getting mad at us for talking too much and flirting too much, and we're doing all of that kind of stuff. And I notice that Stacy wears Jesus cheesy t-shirts a lot. And that's so cool, you know? And I'm like, oh, man, that's so cool. I'm into Jesus too. And, and me being into Jesus too, what that meant is I go to church every single Sunday, Stacy. And I go to youth group every single Wednesday night because I'm a good church kid. And all it really meant was that my family always went to church and they drug me along every single time that they went, but I didn't know Jesus at all. And I didn't love Jesus at all. I'm not trying to bash myself. It was just a season that I was in, but I was in that season and I wasn't a good fit for her. And so we're getting to know each other and and we're flirting around and all this kind of stuff. And part of what she's probably doing, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm remembering like 30 years back. Okay. So give me a break. I'm remembering like 30 years back and like what, what was going through her mind. And I think she was trying to figure me out and she eventually figured out I was just a church attender. I was not somebody who was there yet was Jesus. Not really. And she was, I, I can remember enough. She was. And so she just started backing up. It wasn't harsh. It wasn't cruel. She just started backing up with me. And the flirting, not so much anymore. You know what I'm saying today? And she was discerning the situation well. And a couple things from that that I think you really need to hear today with all of this other stuff is that She couldn't say in that moment, and some of you guys understand what I'm trying to convey here. She could not say in that moment, boy, Josh, you and I just have a a difference here, and you're not into Jesus the way that I'm into Jesus, because you know what I would have done. I would have been like, oh, I can show you how I'll get into Jesus. (laughs) I totally would have done that. Why? Because that'll get me closer to her. But here's the problem, and, and this, this part goes really, really deep, and just let it go if this isn't for you. But one of the things about Jesus, the reason that that wouldn't work is because Jesus, he's got this thing. He will be on the throne of your heart, and he will not dwell there with a rival present. He'll be king, and he'll be Lord. And it doesn't work any other way. And if I would have said, hey, I'll get into Jesus, and she would have said, okay, that's cool. What I was really, would have been really doing is putting Stacy on the throne of my heart. And it wouldn't have worked. So that, another thing I'll tell you is that 
My destiny was not to stay away from Jesus long. God was eventually going to get the throne of my heart. And I was going to give everything to Jesus. And he was going to change everything in my life. Thank God Linda met me after that. Good job, Linda. That's right. Thank you for that. But here's the thing. I don't hate that guy in high school. And if you're, you got somebody you really care about and you're like, I'm just not sure that they passed these signs today. Can I just say, I don't hate them. They're in a place. And I was in a place. And I need a little bit of time. But I was in the wrong season and I was not healthy and I was not a fit. And the best thing that she could do was back up, which she did. So I don't hate you today. Some of you guys are in a relationship right now. And I've said some things this morning. And a few of those red flags are you. And you're like, oh boy. (laughs) And I just want to speak God's grace over you this morning. Really. Pray about this. If you haven't brought this to friends yet, close friends, family that loves you, cares about you, has wisdom, take it to them. Maybe that's your first real step to take this morning is to go and invite some others into the discussion. Am I in a bad place here? And be willing to hear the truth. And if it is time for you to back up or hit pause or whatever it is that you need to do, do not text it to them. Could I just say that? This isn't a text. It's a (laughs) face-to-face. It matters. Because face-to-face is harder, but it's kinder. It's more caring. It's treating them like a person, amen? Amen. I would also say that if you're hearing all this and you're kind of like, hey, wow, I'm the red flag. Don't raise your hand. I'm not asking for that. (laughs) But I would just say, man, I love you. Man, if if part of what you discovered today is that you're not in the healthiest season of your life to be in a partnership like this with somebody, don't listen to the world that says you've always got to be dating someone. Reject that. Here's the great news. The great news is that Jesus chose you already. That's the great news. You don't need a human to choose you because Jesus did. And Jesus loves you and Jesus sees your future and he wants all of you. And the sooner you get Jesus onto the throne of your heart, the sooner he will start to form you into the kind of person that is a healthy partner. There's a new start for you ahead. But you might have to get out of the relationship in order to get to that new start. Lastly, and this is a tough one, but some of you are here in a marriage today. You're like, oh boy, I ignored the signs. And that's also real. That's also real. This, is, this has been more of a dating conversation. I'll just say, and this is, this is going to sound like a cop-out, but it's what the next of this, rest of the series is for. Is we're going to talk about your marriage, and we're going to talk about working on your marriage. Every single week. So come out for it. I don't want to give up on you. I don't want you to give up on you. Remember that love that doesn't let go? Remember happy to be stuck with you? Remember the golden handcuffs of a marriage covenant? God's going to use that. So don't stop loving them. Even if some of these things are there, God has grace for you. Somebody say a louder amen. Amen. God has grace for you. Give yourself to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for wisdom in the choosing. We thank you for truth that might be explaining some things to us today. And Lord, I pray, God, that these precious souls, the eternal souls that are in this room and watching online, that, God, you would reach out to them and that, God, you would speak your direction to them very specifically. We can trust you, Jesus. 
And I pray, Lord, that your grace and your mercy, your kindness, your love would be all there for them, Lord, no matter where they're at and what they're facing, God. And Lord, I pray that you would bless relationships today. In Christ's name, amen.